Um, I'm a professor of something called range management at UC Berkeley. Uh, and it's been a realization of mine from about five minutes after I started graduate school that nobody knows what range management is. And furthermore, uh, my mother thought that I was majoring in something having to do with cooking in the kitchen for years. And then when she found out what it was, she was really, you know, confused. So anyway, uh, mom. So anyway, um, range, rangelands, I'm going to define as I talk. And range management is the management of those lands. And it's basically ecosystem management, but it tends to be the management and ecology. I'm actually a professor of ecology and management. It's the management of the land based on ecosystem ecology. So that's that's my field. And we have a really small graduate program uh, at Berkeley where we have two range master students graduate every year and they are in incredible demand is as anybody with a master's degree or even an undergraduate degree in natural resources. There are enough, not enough people, not enough schools training people who manage forests, who can manage land. And boy, do we need them in case that message hasn't gotten through, we need them, right? because uh, they're burning down. So, uh, uh, but I did have 80 people in my range management class last year. I was really surprised. So that's good. It's not that people aren't interested. Our kids these days don't grow up thinking about forestry and range, I'm afraid. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a little project that I did with an economist friend of mine named Van Butzik. And we had a graduate student who worked with us named Reed Johnson, and we were funded through the California Rangeland Trust. Now, the California Rangeland Trust is a nonprofit organization, an NGO, uh, that holds conservation easements. In other words, its goal is land conservation. And I'll explain that too in just a minute. Um, so they wanted us to find out for them because they need money. You know, they get money from state and federal funds. I hope the 3030 process will invest in some of these lands. Uh, they get money from um, donors. And they have people who own land who donate their land, or who donate an easement on their land. And I'll explain what that means too. So knowing the value of those lands, and what we did is the ecosystem service value of the lands, which I'll explain in a minute too. I'm going to be busy. Um, knowing the value of those lands, being able to translate the value of those lands to the nature, the ecosystem services provided by nature on those lands, they felt would be a good tool to help people understand whether what they were investing in with their donations uh, or their investments or their public money was worthwhile. And so that's why we did the project. And in fact, that's why the term ecosystem services was invented. It was invented uh, to at least put a minimum value on some natural services, things that nature does for us. We know air, oxygen is provided by plants, et cetera, and algae in the ocean. That's worth a lot. So it's a process like that. Um, when, say, a city plan is, or a city is planning to erase a forest and build a power plant or a shopping center or something, you can say, okay, well, we'll get this much from the shopping center. This is how much we're gonna lose from nature. So it was meant to be a decision-making tool, but we applied it to the California Range Land Trust lands. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. And then I'm gonna end with some of the things we simply haven't been able to put a value on. And I have a project to put a value on at least one of those things. Okay, so I'm going to make this slide go forward. It won't go forward. The next picture, okay. there is a map. I thought it was a map. More than half of California, I've just told you I'm a range manager, right? More than half of California is rangeland, 57 million acres of our 100 million acre state. And nearly half of that rangeland is privately owned. California has a lot more private land than most of the West. You know, Nevada is like over 90% public land. That's because California has a history of Spanish land grants. And those Spanish land grants, rather than going into the public domain and into public lands, instead are largely private today. Um, Point Reyes National Seashore is an exception. That was a land grant that became public. Okay, so what are rangelands? This is the rangelands of the state. And you can see the different kinds of vegetation. 
Basically, rangelands is a pretty old fashioned term, but it's about things that are not forest. And one thing you'll find is there's a lot of different definitions of rangelands. Some think people think it means where animals, where livestock is grazed. That does happen to be the number one use of rangelands because they're open lands that have an herbaceous understory, grass and shrubs that elk and deer and cattle and goats and everything else likes to eat. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be grazed. It can be used for recreation, can be used for um, picnics, <laughs> it can be used for wildlife, it can be used for all kinds of things. And uh, oftentimes, and most of the time, is used for all of those things together. So this is a rangeland down in San Diego. Uh, grasslands, shrublands, woodlands, and desert is how we describe it. And um, there's about 35 million acres of California that's public. That's California, and some of that's rangeland. And about uh, 22 million acres here of rangeland that's private. That's the private rangeland. And then I thought I'd be really clever and put on the ocean, except I looked at it and I thought the ocean doesn't go all the way around the state. But uh, you can see the white areas are developed and uh, agricultural croplands and things like that. So in California, our agricultural land is disappearing. It's being converted to all kinds of things. Uh, it's also being encroached upon. Woody vegetation in California is actually increasing despite the fires that we've had, you know, a lot of them, especially the ones in forest areas, are going to turn into brush in the next five years. Many of them already have since the 220 um, fires, makes them even more flammable, unfortunately. Wildfires don't solve our problem. We have to do something to manage those lands if we don't want them to burn again right away. Um, but if current trends continue in terms of development, we'll lose another 2 million acres of farm and ranch land by 2050. And that's private land. So conservation easements are designed to be a market-based willing buyer, willing seller way to conserve land, to keep it from being converted out of agriculture. We don't really have, or uh, particularly grazing, we don't really have a good way to conserve that land right now. We can buy it, but if you buy it and you make it into a park, then somebody has to be hired to manage it. And as we know, we've had our ups and downs with that over time in California, right? With a conservation easement, the land remains private and a family that owns the land takes care of it. So some of the characteristics, you know, I don't know, I've, anybody got a, a mineral, an oil easement on their land or a sewer easement or a power line easement, the conservation easement is a little more comprehensive because it stipulates the land that the easement is on is going to be used for conservation. What it does is for a designated part of your property or all your property, this is what we call the bundle of rights stick. Property ownership is you have different rights when you own a piece of property. If you're in an area with a lot of restrictions, you don't have the park and IRV in your front yard right, right? You don't have the right in most houses to convert them into a shopping center. You're open a business. So even though we like to say, I have my property and this is it, there's things you can't do. And when you sell or donate a conservation easement on a piece of property, the stick of development, your ability to develop the land is sold. It's gone. It's not temporarily taken away. The deed to your land no longer includes that right just like you can't explore for oil on your property. You can find that in the county recorder's office. You can find out if there's a conservation easement on a property if you look, go to the county recorder's office. So um, it's a voluntary agreement. Usually there's a conservation easement or a conservation organization that holds that right, that easement. The Nature Conservancy is one of the biggest in California. The California Rangeland Trust with about 388,000 acres is number two. And there's probably around two to three million acres. Uh, that data hasn't been finished being assessed yet of conservation easements in California today. So government agencies also have them. California Department of Fish and Wildlife has conservation easements on private property for wildlife habitat. All right, and the land is still privately owned. It's just that the title is shared. 
and some of the rights are alienated. And each easement is uh, negotiated individually. So I can't say you can never build a house because you have a conservation easement. You could negotiate when you sell or donate the easement for one house in the next five years, something like that. But you can't fragment the land. You can't convert it even to crops. It has to stay for most of these easements in a semi-natural state. And the people that tend to own these lands tend to be ranchers. They own about 60% of the private rangeland in our state. And about 60% of the private rangeland in our state is grazed by livestock at some time. In addition to being grazed by caterpillars, grasshoppers, deer, elk, wild pigs are crazy to graze, you know, all those things. But livestock are layered on top. And these purple dots here, that's an approximation of conservation easements in California. It's, it's outdated. There's probably twice as many now. But you can see that they're, they're spread throughout the private rangeland of the state. There's also forest easements, but I'm talking about rangeland ones. Oh, there's an arrow indicating a purple blob. I guess that escaped anybody. So what does the California Rangeland Trust think it does? They say, we serve the land, people, and wildlife by conserving California's working landscapes. Working landscapes are landscapes that produce uh, products like food, but at the same time are open space. We see it as open space. The rancher once told me, you know, this is an open space. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, it kind of hurts my feelings when people say open space. I couldn't figure out why, because I, you know, I grew up in L.A., I love open space. I think that's a great idea. Um, he said, open space means there's nobody there. But this is our home. You know, we're taking care of it. And it is true that most of us don't appreciate how much, so much of our open space is taken care of by people and by families. Um, okay, I already said that. All right. Uh, and with those easements then <laughs> comes a rancher. This is a friend of mine who has an easement on his property out in Livermore, uh, talking to one of my classes. And they usually, um, people who sell or donate easements, oftentimes are quite willing to tell people about it, show people what they've done. Uh, this is wonderful for students to get out there and see this beautiful land and to hear somebody talk about how much they care about it and what they do on it. But for us, the investors, it means somebody's going to be there every day, keeping an eye on things, right? You can't say that about a lot of land in California. And you can't imagine things people do to it when it's not watched. They dump trash on it. They set fire to it. They cut down fences. They do all kinds of stuff. So it's good to have somebody there all the time. So this is a classic diagram of ecosystem services. I'm not going to go into a big definition of them. I'm an approximator and a lumper. But anyway, they are the goods and services produced in nature that benefit people. Right? It's not the intrinsic value. It's the value that we get, like air, like carbon sequestered, like water, like food. Food has a market price. So does water, actually in many cases. But food has a market price, and economists really like that, even though they have yet to predict anything in the future. They can sure tell you what happened. Anyway, uh, they have a... I shouldn't talk smack about economists, because <laughs> I worked with one, and I, I adore them. So anyway, um, you, uh, you, can't, um, you can't... It's easy to put a market value on something that has a market like food. You go down to the auction yard and oh, it's worth $1.35 a pound or $10 a pound or whatever it is. But it's much harder to put a dollar value on feeling really happy when you see an open landscape, right? Or the air that we breathe. Or uh, um, the enjoyment we have from walking. Nature bathing, isn't that a thing now? What's the value of nature bathing to you and me? So in this, uh, in this project, we tried to put a value on some of those things. There are the non-tangible, non-market ecosystem values coming from the California Range on Trust easements, because they can tell you pretty easily how much uh, the beef that they sell or the lamb, whatever, is worth. But not so easy to say 
what the value of those lands has been for people just seeing it or hunting or hiking or looking bird watching all those things so can we put a monetary value on them that was one of our project's goals and then once we have this monetary value and we know how much the California Ranch Trust spent to purchase these easements. Can we say that was a good investment, a return on investment? Not very many of these ecosystem service uh, projects do that return on investment. They usually just tell you all these ecosystem services are coming off a piece of land. Isn't that great? It is great. But in fact, if you're going to invest in an easement and that easement is on land that never would have been developed without the easement, that's not a good return on your investment. You didn't change anything. If the easement was going to be converted into a shopping center, then your return on investment might be really good, okay? Because you you uh, invested in keeping that open space, okay? So that was our the goal behind our uh, return on investment. And the goal of that part of that was to help the Rangeland Trust evaluate which kinds and where they should put easements for the maximum return but I won't talk about that too much. Now on their website, they had for a while this thing that said, to keep California beautiful, local food, water sparkling, ranchers ranching, air refreshing, hunters hunting, cow dogs barking, wildlife thriving, and birds singing. Those are non-market values, right? Except for the food one. I uh, told a friend of mine from Spain, you know, ecosystem services include getting to wear a hat if you're a rancher. But anyway, so we tried to value these ecosystem service value things uh, and the return on investment. And then I do want to talk about what was not valued. I was surprised by what could be and what couldn't be valued, not to mention how we did it. So CRT had 56 easements at the time. They had 300,000 acres. Now they have 380. And we used two different approaches to value ecosystem services. Since we knew that our valuation was going to be very approximate and very low, we decided to use two prominent methods so that we get kind of an idea of the range of possibility, right? But really, these are approximations because, you know, a lot of people get spiritual value, for example, off an easement. Pretty hard to value things like that, you know, pretty hard. So we used two uh, approaches and then we did return on investment. I know sometimes I drift from the microphone. I hope it's okay. So one of them was traditional benefits transfer. And that's where you look at all the literature that you can find about the kinds of ecosystems that are on these properties and that have placed a value on what comes from them, including a lot of these non-market values. And they get that through willingness to pay, what people say they're willing to pay to experience these things. And the other one is from how much people did pay. All right. So they use those kinds of ways to assess. They also do surveys. Which would you like to see? And how much is it worth for you to see that? That kind of thing. So using those kinds of valuations, um, two different uh, methods have been developed. One is to look at papers that used those methods. I think that for traditional benefits transfer, most of them are willingness to pay. And uh, put a value on those ecosystems, the flow of ecosystem services coming off them every year. And we picked out ones that we thought applied to our area. And if you look at other studies, most of them use the same studies or some part of those studies. There's just not enough of them out there for the United States, for any place, really. It's expensive to do, yeah. Uh, oh, I can try. A little one, say you want to know what's the recreation value of this piece of land is one way, or this ecosystem. You uh, serve, you, the willingness to pay is you simply ask people, you survey people in a systematic way and say, how much is that worth to you? So that's one method. How much would you pay to do that? Uh, another one is you want to do the same thing, but the other method you use is to find out how much people did spend to go there. So in other words, how much gas did they buy? How much wear and tear on their car? How much uh, expenses for equipment and everything else did they spend money on? That's called revealed preference. So those are two methods, for example. Yeah. Um, another thing would be to say, okay, you get um, 
You get oxygen from the plants here. If you couldn't do it from the easement, how else would you do it and how much would that cost? That's called substitution as another method. Okay. How would you make as much air as this place is making? And what would it cost? So global average is an international, we used an international database. And this is from lands all over the world of particular kinds of vegetation types. It's amazing that this exists. It's online and researchers can get it. And it says, well, a woodland of this type, this is the flow. And here's the ecosystem services we, we managed to find the value of for these properties. And in our report, we include what ecosystem services, not all of them for every kind of vegetation are available. So that's what I mean when I say these are minimum values, just a beginning. So global value average, you go to this global value database and I don't, this data is less local, right? It's for woodlands all over the world, not just our spectacular oak woodlands. So this one is less local. This is more local. We targeted more directly using scientific papers that were out there. So that's the two methods we used. And thank you for your question, by the way. Okay. And uh, when we finished with all this, we had to take do a geographical analysis of all of these easements and find out um, how much of each of these kinds of ecosystems were on each easement, and uh, then multiply that by the per acre, the per hectare values that we got from these two sources. And for traditional benefits transfer, the more local method, we found that the California Rangelands Trust easements produce $1.4 billion per acre per year. Oh no, per year for all of them, sorry, thank you. I once said that livestock grazing removed in a meeting, an international meeting, I said livestock grazing removed something like 2 billion pounds or two, 12 billion tons of dry matter per year. And this woman raises her hand. She goes, but, but, but I just did an analysis. She just studied how much dry grass livestock in the whole world ate. And it was only 2 billion tons. And I'd said 12, because I was talking about millions of pounds, by the way. So um, it's good if you can catch me, please do. They're recording this, right? Okay, so global average was $364 million uh, in ecosystems per year from all of the California Rangeland Trust easements. And in our report, we do have it by easement from which you can get by acre, but this is a total. I don't, I'm sure you don't wanna look at it. Okay. Which is a lot, by the way, it seems to me to be quite a lot. So taking that value, those two values. We then looked at return on investment. Now, I explained this already. Would a conservation easement be developed or not? And there we did this three different ways. I'll talk about two of them. One is we um, just assumed it would be completely developed. That's what um, most of these kinds of ecosystem services studies do. They just say, you didn't put an easement on it. All those easements of ecosystem services are going to be lost. But the other method we used was we looked at the general plan and we have a record of how much was paid for each easement. We looked at the general plan and we um, saw how the property was slated to be developed. We know that's not a perfect uh, system, but anyway, we know that general plans change, but that's what we had. And we got that value. We also used a third value, which I'm not gonna talk about here okay, because it, it was how much the appraiser thought would happen. And that's just an opinion at a moment in time. Anyway, we so we looked at that um, for the development based on the general plan for this modeling, we just assumed it got developed instantly after the property was acquired. So that would also be a little different too. But what it did is give us the difference between what was invested and what we got back in the end. So if there was no possibility of development, then we would get the full return. None of the, yes, if, oh, excuse me, if there was a possibility of complete development, then you get the maximum return. If the general plan said, well, 100 acre parcels or, or something like that, or limited area could be developed, then you would get uh, um, the return from those areas where the ecosystem services would be lost, basically. That's how it works out. Is that reasonably clear? It's the value of things that would have been lost without the investment. Okay, um, 
So those are the three, and we, we're going to look at medium term, which means ranches are developed to the zoned maximum, the general plan, and long term, ranches are fully developed. Okay, so rangeland easements return a dollar thirty-five to three dollars and forty-seven cents for every dollar invested, and that's based on whether you're looking at the global average of the which of the two methods you're using, the global value or the benefits transfer. Global values gave a lower number, but they return nonetheless. That's a pretty good in return on your investment, right? Um, if it's developed to the zoning maximum. If it's fully developed, which is what you usually see in these kind of studies, you assume that it's going to be totally lost if you don't have an easement, then it's $42 to $167, $168 per dollar invested, which is a lot bigger, right? Because some of those easements were not going to be developed in the future, some only half, some maybe a third, you know, and some three fourths. We took that all in, and this is what we got for their return on investment. Either way, it's pretty good. I wish I could make that kind of investment right now. So that has been a useful tool for the California Rangeland Trust to tell people about this, right? That's the goal of the whole ecosystem service thing is to say, look what you got for your money and look what you'll lose if you don't invest, right? But um, I started to wonder, I wasn't very satisfied in some ways. I'm very satisfied in most ways, but there's a lot of other things going on on those easements that are worth something besides these non-market values, right? Because these, it, along with this easement comes somebody managing that land. And there's usually stipulations in the easement about some of the management that has to be done. So rangelands also store more than half the world's carbon. To some extent that's in some of these values, but it's a big issue right now, right? So rangelands globally, you see a lot of different numbers. It's, I was at this meeting last week and I heard 15%, 30%, 50%. It depends on how you define rangelands and what part of the world you're talking about. But I, being a range manager, prefer 50%. Okay, And I take as much territory as I can under my wing. So a lot of carbon in rangelands, most of it's underground. It's in roots. It's pretty resistant to fire. Our grasslands around here have a lot of carbon under them, but the plants die every year. You know, some of it gets incorporated into the soil. Some of it goes, decomposes and goes into the air. Some of it's eaten by animals. But the stuff underground is pretty safe even after a fire. It does tend to come to balance with temperature and rainfall after a while. Um, so conserving rangelands, and you know, we have a lot of activity of putting carbon into the soil in rangelands, uh, managing differently to try to get more carbon in the soil, uh, doing all kinds of things. The way that works the best is to add water, but that's not very desirable. You know, there's a trade-off there between water and, and carbon. But um, what I tell these very sincere, wonderful people, I, there's a model, a paper with a model of California's carbon budget. And it says, gosh, one of the best ways to enhance the carbon budget is to keep land from being converted. Because these rangelands are sequestering carbon and they're storing just really a lot. And so we want to keep them. When you plow land, you release the carbon. Of course, when you develop it, you do. You lose the plants. You know, all kinds of reasons why just conserving land is very valuable when you're talking about improving our carbon budget or maintaining it. And that fits pretty well with what the California Rangeland Trust does, right? And other kinds of conservation easements. It fits my childhood where every place I really loved growing up in Southern California shortly became a suburb. I think that's why I am here today. Uh, anyway, not that people don't need places to live, they do. Um, Okay. And what I tell these uh, people who are working so hard to sequester carbon, I say, yeah, what you're doing is, is important, but you can't play around or work hard to sequester more carbon if you don't have the land to do it on, right? You can't. So the ecosystem service values in our study were based on the biophysical characteristics of the parcel. But the other thing I wanted to know is what about grazing itself? What's that worth? And I know that's weird. That's a weird question for a lot of you, but I want to explain why I think it's worth something. 
One thing is you may have noticed we have a bit of a wildfire problem. And the article that I misquoted was uh, actually said that California cattle remove about 12 million pounds of fuel from our rangelands every year. Just incidental to production. They're not doing it on purpose. They're producing meat and leather and medicines and other things, but they are in the meantime, eating this grass and our grass, most of it is not native. Most of it dies every year. Um, some people are trying to manage animals to restore those grasses, but the point is that it doesn't actually hurt them to consume them up to a point. That's been going on for millions and millions of years, right? They're designed for grazing. They have their growing points are low to the ground. They're not like roses or something where you have lots of buds. The buds are down and close to the ground. The leaves are just the leaves. They have a lot of glass in them. There's a continual war between them and animals that eat them. They're full of glass particles, which is the only reason that some people are not currently living off grass too, is because they will destroy your teeth. So they're, they're, they're designed for grazing and for defending themselves too. And the other thing that uh, grazing does uh, is that it reduces fine fuels. And these grasses are the kindling. I know we're really worried about forest fires, but our woodlands and grasslands are easy places for a fire to start because grass burns so easily. I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience of building a fire in a fireplace or a wood stove, but you start with something tiny, fine, that lights right away. You don't start with a log. So. Um, the grass is a kindling in our landscape and animals will eat it. And they eat it, cattle, you can control cattle a lot more and sheep and goats. You can tell them where to eat, take them off when there's too many, blah, blah, blah. It's, it doesn't work to substitute wildlife and our wildlife are not adapted to our grassland. We have a new grassland. They do okay here, but they're not going to do the same job. Um, and I could talk about that, but anyway. They reduce fine fuels, but they also prevent or slow encroachment of shrubs. And shrubs, when shrubs catch on fire, it's really hard to put them out. When grass burns, it's not so hard. If you catch a fire while it's still in the grassland, I remember seeing those fires near Crockett on TV, and the fire remember just standing around, the grass was burning slowly down the hill. But once it gets into shrubs or woody vegetation, it goes crazy. So reducing the encroachment of shrubs, and I told you this before, it's really happening. Douglas fir is taking over our oak woodlands. Shrubs are taking over our grasslands. Uh, it's, it's a little nuts. We don't have Native American burning anymore to keep things in check, right? All right. So those are two things, the short term and the long term. This is from the study uh, by a bunch of UC uh, extension people. And um, most of them are alums, by the way. And uh, they did it by county by county, laboriously from county reports, how much grazing went on in each county. And they got that 12 million pound figure. But the other night, the first author and I were talking and we started screwing around with these pictures on Google Earth. And the San Francisco Estuary Institute has this picture, this layer from 1939. And then we had one from 20, well, very recently, I think it's more like 2020 or something. But this is the only time I wish I had a laser pointer. I'm not gonna talk now. Uh, these lines are the same, 1939. Look at the vegetation there. So much grassland. This is all a forest. It's not been grazed. It's just a forest and a north, steep north slope. This has been developed to housing. Uh, but here in Wildcat Canyon Park, East Bay Regional Park, it's been grazed pretty much continuously above that red line. Below this red line, this is the Tilden Natural Area. It's not grazed. And it's really, you can see that shrubs, I lost my microphone. You can see that shrubs have increased in both places, but so much more in the ungrazed site. And if you have a kind of shrub that livestock will control, and they'll only control it if they're grazing it from the time it's really tiny. They can't really get to it much when it gets hard and big, but they'll keep it out. And so we're losing that historical landscape. And at the same time, building fire hazard. I, I, that is so close, Tilden, right on the border of Berkeley. And we know we've had some pretty big fires there. Um, it's an accident waiting to happen, I think. We'll see, we can never, it's very hard to predict where it's gonna happen. I guess we're just like economists. We can say what happened, but 
hard to predict what's going to happen next, but I, that's, that's dangerous. So that's one thing that grazing does, and that's got to be worth something. And so we do have a project trying to get a dollar value on that. We also have a market price for it with people paying sh people to bring sheep and goats in to graze areas near houses. I tell people, you know, prescribed burning is good, but when you're in a town, you have a fire escape, you know, if, if the fire escapes, you're gonna like take out half of New Mexico, right? But if a goat escapes, it becomes a humorous anecdote on the evening news. You know, the police are chasing the goats around and goats are funny, I have to say. Yeah, they're really good. They like to eat goat. They, goats like to eat brush, cattle like grass. So I think uh, goats are the pruning shears are for our vegetation and cattle are the vacuum cleaners. It takes five goats to eat as much grass as a cow. You know, you can have a lot of fun with that. Um, but the fact is most of our cattle are not grazed for fire hazard control. If we unleash them for that purpose, we could really do a lot, I think, really do a lot. But right now, uh, a ranch person doesn't want their animal, they want their animals to get fat fast. A goat owner, their, their source of income is not meat, it's the control of shrubs. So it makes it a little, it's different. I would like to see cattle used. I think we need to use everything we've got, including prescribed burning. You know, I see what's happening on those burned areas in the Sierra and I just feel ill. It could have been prevented. But California has been really good at reducing our carbon emissions. Really good. So you can see we got all the way down there by 220. What happened in 220? <laughs> I should do that now. But we had a lot of fires. A lot of fires, you may recall. My daughter called me up and she goes, Mom, are we on Mars now? Because everything was red. Well, this is interesting. This is a California Air Resources Board. They consider wildfires natural, so they don't report them in these numbers. So emissions from the wildfires at 220 are not in these numbers. You can find them if you go through. And I, so I added them from 2020 from fire. Can you see that? That's 100 million metric tons added to the total state budget of 380. Is it 380, 3.7? Unbelievable, unbelievable. And I don't think it's natural either. It's not natural. It's a result of our effects on the climate and our effects on forests and our ignorance of Native American management, all those things. It's shocking. So preventing that kind of thing could be a good idea. Uh, while managing the vegetation, prescribed burning helps a lot. It, and grazing is something that's easy, cheap, and you can do year after year. I always tell students, don't study prescribed burning because you'll never get one done before you have to file your dissertation. It's so hard to get everything set up. Another value of grazing, this is um, Tulare Hill near San Jose. The residents there love those flowers. They're pretty nice, right? Beautiful flowers, California poppies, other things. So they took grazing off to protect those flowers, and that's what they wound up with. Because our grazing lands are largely occupied by non-native grasses that have way more biomass than our native grasses, the non-native grasses are annual too, and they grow anytime there's a good rain year. This year, boy, we're going to have a lot of them, right? But they're going to, they die, and then they fall over, and they create a thatch that damages and reduces both plant and animal diversity in the grassland. So this is another thing that I think one could value. Um, Coyote, anybody here been to Coyote Ridge, the reserve down in Morgan Territory or Jepson uh, Vernal Pools? They have a grazing program for precisely this reason, to keep the heavy grasses off those millions of wonderful little flowers and to keep water in the pools because annual grasses suck up that water too. Very famous piece of research on vernal pools and grazing. Oh, Jepson, they use sheep, I think. But uh, if you go down to Merced, they use cattle. Those vernal pools were on, a, I think it's the Flying M Ranch originally, and they've been grazed forever. Okay, so these are just some of the rare and threatened species that benefit from having that biomass removed by grazing. Even the fairy shrimp in the vernal pools. Vernal pools, because it gets rid of all that heavy grass, so these little flowers can 
survive and so the water will stay in there. The one in the middle is a stock pond in the Bay Area. Half of the habitat for the California tiger salamander is in stock ponds built by ranchers because a lot of the vernal pools have been developed and converted to things like UC Merced. Um, so this tiger beetle, you know, when I started graduate school, everybody said, oh, you have to manage, you know, bare ground. Bare ground's bad. And this consultant called me up. They sent him on a project for the Ohlone tiger beetle. Oh, I got to stop pretty soon. And um, I need to know how to make bare ground. It needs bare ground. It really turned my life upside down. So I thought and thought, and I thought of some ways you can have put things out that'll attract animals and make trails, right? That's bare ground. Um, the kit fox likes to see burrowing. Owls are a classic. I love them. They're so cute, but they, they like to see. If they don't have grazing, they mow. They go out there and mow um, to protect it. Lizards, kangaroo rats, red-legged frogs, et cetera. Morgan Hill, um, Coyote Ridge. Coyote Ridge is for that checker spot butterfly. And there, uh, nitrogen depositions from 101 were creating so much grass that the flowers that the butterfly needs to reproduce were getting choked out. So they use grazing to get rid of the grass. It's all about getting rid of that biomass. Cattle don't eat the flowers very much. They're too small and they don't taste as good. It just happens to be a great thing. All right. And we published a paper on this. My uh, student and mentor, Sheila Berry, she's a county director in Santa Clara County, but she was also my student for a while. Wonderful friend. Um, she went through all of the California Fish and Wild, oh, the National Fish and Wildlife Service listing documents from the Fish and Wildlife Service. They have no reason to say anything about grazing that's positive, and they generally don't. And it, if, if, if you haven't proven that grazing is beneficial, they're going to say it's harmful. That's just how they are. And so six, according to those listing documents, 64% of listed animals and 56 of all listed animal species on rangelands benefit from grazing. Not all grazing, not all the time, but done right, they do. It's amazing, I would never have expected that. So her paper said, working landscapes, when you combine production with nature and ecosystem service production can work. Don't have a good value on that. So my startling conclusion is that conserving rangelands is a pretty good investment. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to make a comment that here on in Sacramento on Jackson Highway, Highway 16, um, there's a big strip of vernal poles uh, that are protected. Right now, they're just water puddles, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very big water puddles. But in a few months, they'll be full of the little flowers and uh, such. They're really cool. And even from one pool to another, you can have different... A lot, of, species. A really lot of the schools in the area, that's part of their um, science project for the kids is to go out and see the vernal poles. Great. That's really cool. I think we have a question from the chat, Janet. Yeah. Um, the first question is, where or how do the conser conservation easements originate? Oh, well... <laughs> They're voluntary, so that mechanism was developed, and a lot of ranchers have don't have an, they're cash poor. They have these very valuable lands, really, but they don't have enough to send their kids to college or enough to pay the bills because ranching is not very profitable, frankly. Rangeland grazing, where you're grazing animals on grass, so some of them want to sell an easement so that they can keep ranching. You know, most ranchers, somebody in the household or everybody in the household works. And they put that money into the ranch. And the only way they'll ever get that money out is to sell it for development. So a conservation easement gives them an alternative. Also, um, a rancher dies. The kids don't want to ranch. They want to split up the ranch or get the value out. They can sell an easement and get some of the value out without having to break up the land. And some ranchers will say, I know my kids will divide up the land and sell it if I die. With the easement, they'll have to get that money and not divide up the ranch. Even if it goes into somebody else's hands, they, they want it to stay intact. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, will the conservation easements reduce the property taxes on the property? They're supposed to. 
sometimes they do. Uh, most of the time they do because you're only taxed. The highest and best use is not development anymore, but it's um, grazing. So that's pretty low. So it does reduce your taxes in that way. If your property is like a mini Yosemite or something, there's going to be people out there who want to buy it whole. And that creates another value that you might get taxed on, which will mess that up. But it should keep your land zoned agricultural in perpetuity. Is the money <clears throat> is the money that they get, is that a one-time payment? And is that paid back or is that a gift? Um, okay, so I'm a rancher. I sell my conservation easement. So I've sold it. They get to keep the easement and I get to keep the money, right? It's just like selling your land, except you're not. You're selling rights to your land. But um, that is a problem that it's a one-time payment. And so some now uh, the conservation organizations tend to look for a management endowment to go along with that money. So there's an endowment, just like I'm an endowed chair. I have a certain amount of money that I get every year for research. There's a certain amount of money available to support various activities. Um, and, and yeah, the one-time thing has been, been hard. I know a guy who first sold a butterfly easement, then he sold a stock pond easement. You know, he's got little patches of it around. So he, um, he, uh, they built a golf course next door and to mitigate for that, they bought easements on his land to protect the species habitat that were going to wipe out with the golf course. So he had that opportunity and that really, that helped him pay his inheritance taxes. At the time he was hit with this enormous inheritance tax burden. But now there's more opportunities. The Fish and Wildlife um, does various contracts with people that help provide them with a little income and so on and so forth um, that help with that daily or yearly annual income. Yeah. So uh, do these companies that buy the easement, what if they're, if they're the nonprofit or whatever, if they go out of business or they have a problem, are these easements being transferred between different organizations? Or? Well, yes, yes. It's just like property. So if you buy a house and then heaven forbid you pass away, um, somebody else inherits it or gets it or it's transferred somehow. Um, the way that a conservation easement can be extinguished is the same way that, um, an ownership can be extinguished. You have a house, it's decided it's in the prior, in the public interest to build a freeway on it. They can condemn your property and take it away. The government can do that to an easement too. But that, that would, otherwise it remains in the um, title and there is a law. There's laws they have to meet. There's a conservation easement law, I forget the number, but it stipulates that it has to be used for conservation. So you, that's, it's protected. Presumably, if the Nature Conservancy went out of business, they would transfer their things to other trusts. So, so is there a difference between like American River Conservancy um, uh, works with work with BLM? I figure out who's talking. Yes. Right oh, there you are. Okay, oh, good. American River Conservancy worked with BLM, and they have Cronin Ranch, all the trails there, and they bring in. Um, sometimes cattle, but they usually have sheep, you know, at certain times of the year. So is that different than having an easement when they've will they've dedicated the land to uh oops, sorry. I guess recreation, but but they bring in goats? Yeah, goats and sheep. Well, who owns that land? It's um it's BLM. Okay. So an easement like conservation easement is private land. So it was private. I mean, American River Conservancy, it was donated, and mm -hmm. then they've, they've worked with BLM. So I'm not sure exactly. Well, uh, like the public trust for public land, they buy private land and they transfer it to public ownership. Mm -hmm. So that's not an easement. Okay, so that's different. Yeah, it, it is different. But And a lot of land trusts own land. They have their own land as well as easements, too. I think the Nature Conservancy has their own reserves as well as easements. So both kinds of things happen. Uh, the BLM, I'm right now calling up BLM and Forest Service people as part of this research project to find out if they pay for grazing by cattle and sheep and goats. Um, and it's been interesting to find out. Every, everything is different, but the Forest Service has a couple. 
the BLMs in Nevada said that they won't charge a grazing fee if a rancher does non-production grazing for them, like for fire or invasive species control. So they're paid $1.35 an acre for that um, if they pay no fee, which is not very much. <laughs> Whereas a goat grazer makes $600 to $1,000 an acre. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm just kind of curious. Do you have... Um... Do you have a waiting list of people who want to give easements or are, are you out of money to, to buy easements or how does that financially, are you able to do what you want to do with people that, that, that want to, to do it? Yeah. <laughs> well, they, is, they want to do the right thing, but you may. Yeah, no, that the, I'm not with the California Rangeland Trust. I'm just a professor, but I, the project happened to be funded by them. But um, they do have a waiting list. They have a long waiting list. And they try to get the money from donors. They try to get people to donate the easements. But they also get a certain amount of public money. There's public, for the RCDs, resource conservation easements, there's public money out there to meet certain needs. And if the easement meets one of those needs, like watershed conservation, protecting where water comes from, or, or something like that, then they can have access to that money. And I just mentioned this this rancher who has the butterfly easement, he has a flower easement, and he has a stock pond easement. And a lot of that money for different counties have different rules um, for what happens when a person like a golf course says we want to develop this area, or uh, a company wants to make it into housing, and it's going to take out some rare species, right, their habitat. So they'll demand that that company mitigate by replacing that habitat with twice as much habitat or maybe the same amount of habitat. I don't know. Every county is different. But in Contra Costa County, where this guy works, uh, has his land, it was something like twice as much. So some of that can be easements. So developer money can go into easements too. Those are called mitigation easements. And we didn't, we didn't include them because they're different. But that's another source of money for easements that's out there. This may be the same answer, but I'm not sure. I'm, this is an extension of Chris's question about once there is an easement, a conservation easement on a piece of property, if some guy has a buttload of money and he wants to do a golf course over that whole area, can can that happen? Can he buy out the easement and then make something else out of it? Well, he would have to convince the Nature Conservancy or the California Rangeland Trust might be able to sell it. Um, I don't know exactly how the law applies, but I think they can, as long as the easement holder and the landowner agree. I don't, I can see that happening. Maybe if uh, the builder offered them so much money, they could buy five other easements. Maybe. I don't know though if it's possible, but it would have to be more like a land sale. Do you know? No. Huh? They're in perpetuity the same way if you buy a property, it's in perpetuity if you want it to be. I mean, but most of us believe they, the only really the cases I know of are con condemnation for various reasons. But theoretically, I suppose it could happen. It would be such a violation of the trust of the donation community that you would it'd be kind of foolish to do that. Because if I donate, I want it to be in perpetuity. Okay, over here. All right. <laughs> Uh, the first question is, how does a cons conservation easement compare to Williamson Act? Okay. So Williamson Act is a 10-year rolling contract. When you sign up for the Williamson Act, it means you promise not to develop your land for 10 years. So that's one difference. If you do develop your land, then you have to pay uh, all the back taxes because it gives you a tax break. Okay. So it, it, that's at, you may have to pay some extra too. I'm not sure exactly, but you have to pay big bunch of money if you want to develop before 10 years is up. But if you wait 10 years and you don't re-enroll, I mean, landowners re-enroll every 10, every year, you have to stop re-enrolling and then wait 10 years and then you can develop it given the general plan and all those other things. The Williamson Act also doesn't prevent conversion to intensive cropping. So you could have a ranch under the Williamson Act and you can change it to a vineyard, which I know some of you would vote for, um, or whatever, you could do that under the Williamson Act, whereas with a conservation easement, they want it to be natural land. One more question. Um, <clears throat> what type of conservation measures 
or easements were taken in the conversion of the first ranch property in San Simeon about 30 years ago. Yeah, that's a California Rangeland Trust easement. It's like 80,000 acres. It's an amazing place. And imagine all the ecosystem service values that all those people taking those buses up to the castle are consuming, you know, zebras, you know, whatever. But um, <laughs> I love that. It's fun. So, uh, yeah, that, I don't know all the details, but they have a regular, we did have a meeting there, actually. I got to see that ranch. It's so great. But they have uh, one, most of the property has a regular conservation easement on it, just like I've been talking about. I think they donated some of it. I'm not sure it was purchased, but it's an easement. They can't develop uh, the property. You know, the Hearst Ranch is an interesting term because there's Hearst Ranches all over California. It's just one of them. It's really something. So anyway, that that place um, is under a regular conservation easement. There's an area near the coast that's a special conservation easement where they permit recreation and, and use by the public, as I understand it. It's a smaller area, it's near the coast, very high value for recreation. Most conservation easements don't. On the other hand, the ranchers, some ranchers are making a little income by providing bird watching and horseback riding and other kinds of activities on their land. But for most of them, there's a value in not being in the service industry. So they, they don't include that. But first ranch, yes, there's a small easement along the coast. Small to them. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Hunsinger, uh, I was so excited to hear your talk today that I forgot to introduce you. <laughs> but I think it was unnecessary. Get all the things you told us, uh, I think I could have listened to you for, for hours and hours because just the valuation questions fascinate me. Um, uh, we want to thank you for your enlightening presentation. And as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you an honorary membership and the Renaissance Society. And we'd like to make a, uh, a donation to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Fund here at CSU Sacramento. Uh, I, I know that many of you know about the food pantry. Uh, we're still seeking contributions. Uh, uh, we do it every month, first of the month in any classes you're taking. But you can also go online to the Renaissance Society site to make a contribution. It's often a hard time for students these days, and they really, are, we're one of the biggest, if not the biggest contributors to the food pantry. So we can be proud on that, and we uh, proud of that, and we need to keep doing it. Um, next week is the result of three different members of the forum committee last year thinking we should have a talk about water. And all three of those suggestions from the forum committee thought we should have Dr. Jeffrey Mount make that presentation. So he is going to come next week to talk to us about how we can do more with less uh, with water. He's a, a emeritus professor at UC Davis, and uh, he's now a, a senior fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. If you've been taking any of David Abelson's great classes on water, this I think is right up your alley. Uh, we hope to see you next week. Goodbye.